Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speaker. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier. Discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. Hi, I'm Lisa Joy Sigorski with the National Science Foundation. The creativity of chemists, and specifically, the vast creativity of one in particular. Each year, the National Science Board selects an honoree for its Public Service Award. This award commends individuals for advancing discovery and communication to the public, public outreach, scientific literacy, the development of broad science and engineering policy, and for encouraging the next generation of scientists and engineers. Roald Hoffman has done all of that and more. He is a professor of chemistry at Cornell University. He has been active in chemical research for decades. He received the 1981 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. But wait, there's more. Dr. Hoffman has engaged in a lifelong effort to educate the public about chemistry and its place in culture, and in very creative ways. Congratulations, Roald, and thanks for being here. I'm glad to be here, Lisa. And also here today is Luis Echigoyan. Born in Habana, Cuba, Luis is the director of NSF's Division of Chemistry. He is on leave from Clemson University, where he is a professor of physical chemistry and former chair of the chemistry department. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Roald, the creativity of chemists. I never would have put those two words together. Yet in the short time that I've gotten to know you and your work, the two words are inseparable, and you embody their combination. Tell me about your work. Well, uh, first of all, let me tell you why you should think of chemists as creative. I mean, chemists make molecules. We make things, uh, things that were not on Earth before. With that, there may come an ethical responsibility. But we are very much like artists. We create the objects of our own contemplation. We're also like engineers, too. We build molecules, and we have to worry about whether they will be effective or not. Um, I am a theoretical chemist, so... That seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> well, as uh, Lewis knows, uh, theoreticians are a minority in chemistry, maybe 15% of academic departments, maybe 5% mm -hmm. in industry. But it's great fun. Uh, theory basically answers the question, oh, why? Oh, oh. But I also like to push it further. First of all, I, li I, I don't like only explaining what experimentalists have found that, and they turn to me for an explanation of either the structure of a molecule or the properties. But I also want to push them. So I'm, I love predicting molecules that haven't yet been made. And uh, they should be moderately unreasonable. What I mean by that, the predictions. If the prediction takes 30 years to, to fulfill, no one's going to do it. Uh, a lifetime of a graduate student is, might be what my friends might invest to pr prove some crazy idea of my own. But I, I love doing that. I love understanding. I would like to add something to the creativity part of chemistry. Uh, it's one of the few sciences where you really are not reacting just to what nature is giving you. Measuring laws of physics is very important, but the chemist can make molecules that don't exist in nature, as I like to tell my students, because we do synthesis. Uh, when you make that first milligram or two milligrams of a compound, you're holding the world supply of that compound, which is quite unique. Very few sciences can do that. It's very, very creative. It, it's a wonderful feeling it to is. hold those first few milligrams in your hand. and. One interesting thing, there's no way to tell a lie about them. Um, what I mean is you, you make the molecule, you do the best to find out what its shape is in three dimensions, mm -hmm. what its properties are. 
you don't have the words to express sometimes the properties. You tr try to use words that they use somewhere else. It, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling. It's actually very close to art. What inspired your interest in chemistry? Well, uh, there are many things. Uh, I think, interestingly, there were two books um, when I was 10 years old, and I was in a refugee camp in Germany. The books were in German. They were um, put out. James Conant, the president of Harvard, who was a chemist, uh, was the commissioner for Germany, and he put out these books to teach Germans democracy, I think. And one was a biography of Marie Curie by, uh, uh, by her daughter Eve. And that one has inspired many people, but another one was a, a biography of George Washington Carver, the black American agricultural chemist. He made everything from soybeans and sweet potatoes. Uh, you know, as a little kid in Germany, I didn't, I had never seen a soybean nor a sweet potato, <laughs> either one. <laughs> so this was interesting. That was one thing. In chemistry, I didn't do too well in, oh, I did well, but I wasn't that interested in high school. I went to a science-oriented high school in New York City. The only advanced placement course that I didn't take was in chemistry. I took in physics, biology, and math. I came to chemistry by accident. Um, parental pressure to become a doctor finally resisted in college. Um, the world opened up in the arts and humanities, and that's remained with me. I didn't decide till halfway through graduate school in chemistry that I wanted to be a chemist. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a particularly good example of <laughs> <laughs> from childhood on. Well, that implies that there is some path, some formulaic experience. There are, there are different paths to chemistry, many different paths, but certainly one of them is doing experiments. I've heard from researchers who express some of the things that fuel their continued interest through the dry spells, and they express that aha moment, a moment in which there's a discovery, there's clarity, there's something surprising, there's something mesmerizing. My sense is you have at least one. Could you tell us about something? I am a little resistant to aha moments. I think it's a gradual process. I think we feed into a mythology with the aha moments. But uh, there are, what I see is this. There are these things. I'm thinking about a molecule, and my mind is a mess. There are lots of ideas there, lots of possible ideas about how to explain the shape of this molecule. Um, it, it, let me be specific about shape. I mean, it could be uh, when we have, uh, we carry oxygen in our blood, there is a molecule called hemoglobin that does it. There is an iron atom in a little ring. The oxygen attaches itself to the iron bending like this and not straight up like that. Here's the iron atom, here's the oxygen molecule, two atoms. It's not standing up, it's bending. Carbon monoxide goes straight up. Why? That's a typical theoretical question, try mm -hmm. to understand why. And I think about it, there's a mess in my mind. I have many explanations. Someone asked me to talk about it. Maybe I'm talking to my research group about it. So I come up with an explanation. I come up with an explanation. The moment I voice it, it becomes more real than it was. And being human, I find arguments to support that explanation. Also being human, other people in a community are not going to like my arguments mm. when I publish them. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking to an audience, the thing comes real. One idea I had was, for instance, I did a calculation on a molecule all of my ideas are small, but then I build them into frameworks of some sort. But I, I, I did some calculations on a molecule which had two nitrogens in it. And there were supposed to be pairs of electrons on the two nitrogens. The molecule is pyrazine, a ring of six carbons. There were two nitrogens opposite sides. They, 
those two lone pairs, as we call them. Notice the anthropomorphic language, sort of we lone <laughs> pairs. We're yeah. talking about these as if uh, that's a large part of humanizing these in the material things, that so we get, build a relationship with them. Uh -huh. Nothing specific about chemistry even there, though uh, it's interesting. I found when I did a calculation that those two lone pairs, which were supposed to be lone and not feeling each other, in the calculation were split in energy. Okay, what that means is I can do an experiment using a spectrometer to get that splitting. But it, the experiment wasn't done, wasn't doable when I did this. I did the calculation, I found them split by two and a half EV, which was a large amount of energy. And I didn't understand it. And if you had asked anyone, they would have said, no, those things are at the same energy. So I looked for an explanation. It had something to do with the interaction of those electrons with other electrons and bonds in a molecule. I found an explanation based on symmetry. It, it, it was early on. That was an aha moment mm -hmm. uh, that I saw at that moment. I'm watching your face, Louise, and mm -hmm. you're nodding knowingly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My sense it. is you've had similar experiences in yes. the lab. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, to, to a large extent, I think what Roll says is true. It's pretty evolutionary. You, you do things and you go one step at a time, but at one point you do get to that and say, yeah, okay, this is really very, very uh, important. And, and when you communicate it, people then catch on to it. So we, we've had some of those uh, yeah. in, in our own work. But we fund, out of the NSF, many people like uh, Rob, who push these frontiers all the time. I should say that NSF is the only place that uh, funds people like me, <laughs> <laughs> just about. Um, what I mean by that is I, I call what I do applied theoretical chemistry, but it's not because it's applied in the usual sense. I don't hold a single patent. Um, I'm not particularly proud of that, <laughs> uh, but I don't. It's just the way I am. Uh, the, I'm, I'm a theoretician. I, I get ideas. I give them to the community. They're a gift. I get other gifts back. But um, I, uh, I understand these things completely. I try to understand them. It, it's a very special joy. And a lot of funding in this world is directed toward missions. Mm -hmm. They are worthwhile missions, fuel cells, drugs for AIDS. But what I do is really, it's not that it's blue skies research, it's to provide the foundation for the understanding. From the paper that I did with Woodward, mm -hmm. many, many drugs were synthesized using the reactions that we postulated, that we formed the theory for. So I'm, NSF gives me that chance when I've had funding from other agencies, but I won't name them. <laughs> but the, in the end, uh, they have stopped, but NSF hasn't. It, it, an important point to make there is uh, we were talking about the vast synthetic world of chemistry. Uh, the estimation, if you talk about simple elements like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. Uh, there, there are small molecules, approximately 10 to the 40 small molecules that you can make different. I don't know if you have a concept of 10 to the 40, but it's for tiny. the most, it, it, it's, it's, <laughs> like, it's like infinite, yeah. literally. It's yeah. almost like infinite. We don't even have 10 to the 8 uh, compounds characterized right, right. now. So, so are we going to make all 10 to the 40? Obviously, no. And that's why we need people like Roll, who give you the fundamentals of what makes this particular compound or be stable or not be right. stable or have particular properties. We don't want to sample. Tend to, if, if you get all the chemists in the world together to make all of the possible compounds, it would be almost like a blind uh, search. Yes, but Louis, are you going to trust us when we do those calculations? Uh, that's <laughs> an interesting uh, question. More and more, uh, theor theory is really approximating. Uh, yes, the but has the ability to predict properties that later on can be I measured. think so, and there are some yes. things that cannot be measured. You have a molecule out in interstellar space. I'll give you an example. There's a molecule with three carbons and two hydrogens, cyclopropylidine. It's an unstable intermediate. Um, 
on normal Earth conditions, on interstellar dust grains, it's present in amounts that we can s that our astrono astronomy friends can see the spectra of. It tells them something about the chemistry on those grains. You can only do a calculation on that. But at the same time, I would say, be well advised to mistrust the hype of theoreticians. Sure. Uh, they will tell you that they can do everything. Uh, and, uh, historically, too, this is an interesting question because theory has evolved tremendously. I'm, I'm old enough to remember the days when theoretical predictions really were far uh, away from measured values. So you would calculate something and it would be really very different from what the experimental yes. value was. Mm -hmm. But that has really evolved tremendously in the last 10 years or so to the point that you can do almost theoretical predictions yes. that are pretty much uh, uh, very, very good, almost as good as the experiment. Yes, but uh, the approach is something interesting I want to mention. Even in those days, people like Pauling, Mulliken, and others, their work uh, had a value in chemistry. It formed frameworks for understanding, models for understanding, like Hickel's rule, mm -hmm. which directed research, helped understanding. The people you're talking now about, the theoreticians, are more in the realm of simulation. Mm -hmm. That is, they are using the maximum power of computers. And my whole life has been tied up with, with computers. I, the sound of a key punch is in my head. I can't get it out. Uh, I began with the IBM 604 with punch cards and such. Couldn't have done what I did without them. But all my life I've spent fighting them also because I'm basically trying to build models for understanding. So there's, this is not only in chemistry, it's also true in economics and other fields. There are, there are people who build models in terms of analyzing the factors and order of magnitude estimates of their contribution. And then there are people who calculate things, brute force calculate. They are in a dominant yes. d growing role in, in chemistry and economics elsewhere. Well, our program in chemistry, uh, chemistry division is called TCC, which is theoretical and computational. And yeah. the vast majority of the people in, in that group are doing computational work. So they're cranking uh, with computers, doing finer and finer approximations. There are, there are interesting things that right now it seems to me that the, some of the mentality of man-computer interactions, woman-computer interactions, are such that they move you against thinking that there could be a simple model or in devising the simpler model. A typical example is I calculate a property of a molecule, something called a dipole moment, let's say, of water. And uh, I get it right to within three significant figures with experiment. Then I ask my friend, uh, can you do it for if I put, instead of the, of the hydrogen, if I put a fluorine on there? And he says, I have to go back to my computer. <laughs> I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say, who understands that? Uh, he will get the answer right. Mm -hmm. So I'm fighting a little bit yeah. because I belong to the model builder, sort of, even though I use computers. Uh, and there are some we're having some problems in the community. The good thing is that the models we provide, those little drawings of orbitals, they look like flowers, like figure eights, which tell you where the electrons are in a the molecule. They're portable, they're teachable. Mm -hmm. The calculations can also be done, but our models have a persistence through the teaching process in the uh, spirit of chemists and what they understand. Mm -hmm. Presenting frameworks of understanding, yours in the area of education and in engaging the public and yes. students are very, very creative. Describe some of them for us. They're very non-traditional. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, first of all, I'm a teacher. I'm proud of it. I've Remember when the, the chairman of my department, Harold Chiraga, at that time said in my second year at Cornell, you're going to teach freshman chemistry. That's how it was done those days. I didn't particularly like it, but I loved it after a while. And I've taught introductory chemistry half of my time. It's very important to me. It's, I think, important for my theoretical work, too. It taught me how to explain, for instance, 
thermodynamics without the crutch of mathematics to do it and qualitatively. Um, but I'm actually writing a paper now together with Sandra McGuire at Louisiana State University, who was a former student of mine, who was a leader in science education, got an NSF award recently, presidential award for science teaching. Uh, and it's called 10 Proven Strategies for Teaching. And we, we try various things, but uh, for it, you wanted me to name something. <laughs> um, a strategy we tell the students is uh, studying for an exam. Uh, if you want to study for an exam, you want to get into my mind. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to do. So the only way to get into my mind is by getting into my mind. What I mean by that is you, you make up an exam. Mm -hmm. So get together with a group of kids. It takes time, takes self-control, all of, all of those things. But make up an exam. What happens is you make up some questions and your friend will say, it can't be that bastard is not going to ask that question <laughs> on, this, on this exam. And so what you get is a dialogue going between the students on what's realistic and what's not realistic. That dialogue is very hard to establish in your own mind. So there are two components in this. One is group studying, um, and Sandra is supplying the cognitive foundation for these strategies, which is there. And psychology experiments. One is that studying in groups can be more effective, and the other one is empathy. Now, in, of course, empathy of the teacher for the student, that's what makes a good teacher. Yeah. But also, I'm asking in this case for a reversal. <laughs> I'm not asking for sympathy from the <laughs> student. I'm asking for them to put themselves in my situation. That's right. Uh, so and to challenge themselves, to challenge. like you will. Yeah. So that's one little. And generationally, uh, I, I, the American Chemical Society recently had a study done about perceptions and ways of uh, uh, the younger generations, how they learn chemistry. And uh, one of the conclusions you mentioned is that the newer generations are much better working in groups. They, they like yes. groups. Uh, older folks like us are a little bit more of the loner type generations, and we used to learn more isolated. Yeah. But today's uh, young people, in chemistry in particular, they, they like groups, to the point where the ACS did a, a, an analysis of how they perceive chemists. And the young people liked chemists. Uh, uh, might be a surprise. It was a surprise when I heard about it. it. Yeah. Uh, chemists normally have a bad reputation. <laughs> they perceived chemists as being uh, good professionals and whatever, but loners. So oh. e ever since uh, then, ACS is always showing pictures showing of chemists pictures groups, together, yeah. groups of people. Uh, it's very That's important right. for the younger groups. That is important. Yeah. There are problems in studying in groups. The uh, teaching a uh, second piece of teaching advice we give in this paper is in studying, follow a sequence alone, together, alone. So first you engage with the material yourself. Mm -hmm. Next, mm -hmm. you will have blind spots. You will not understand then a group can help you. Group has dangers, there's group psychology, there's always a leader and followers. Mm -hmm. And if you are a passive person, you will be in trouble in a group. Mm. Anyway, at some point, therefore, you have to come out of the group and face existentially the exam or the studying at some point. But that sequence, we found, helps students. Uh, groups are very interesting. There's more of, more of a trend of a group teaching, also through use of individual response devices called clickers to to ask questions in real time in a class, which is really a kind of dialogue to measure the understanding. It's a very interesting time in teaching. Mm -hmm. Now take me back a step further. I'm a freshman in college and I'm interested in the humanities. I want to be a writer. I want to study English. I'm looking at, you know, taking instead of freshman chemistry, I'm thinking of taking rocks for jocks. Mm -hmm. or science for English majors. Why should I study chemistry? Why should I consider c studying chemistry? Well, chemistry is there in, in everyday life, first of all. It is the truly anthropic science. What I mean by that is uh, those galaxies or those rocks or those quarks, big, small, 
by and large, they're very interesting intellectually, and I love them, but they will not heal you nor hurt you. When you go to a doctor, and if you have a child and you ask for, uh, with a fever, you ask for a prescription, there's a new antibiotic that's given, you hope that it'll heal you. You trust the doctor, um, but you also worry about side effects. That establishes a relationship, a human relationship, and I'm not afraid of the fear part of the equation. I think it's necessary. It establishes a relationship between you and a molecule. When I see um, that uh, methamphetamine is one hydrogen away from, uh, from pseudoephedrine uh, that is there as an anticongestant, it makes me think. I, I, I think we have to show those structures, both of methamphetamine and of pseudoephedrine, to see how close they are to each other, mm. how a few atoms the difference between male and female sex hormones, God knows an important difference, right, um, is um, just a few atoms. Mm. And one is made from the other. Testosterone is made from, from estradiol, and, and, and then in turn it is made in progesterone, into progesterone. And all of those are made in controlled ways in the body in different amounts in males and females. That so. The reason is to know the world around us, to be able to engage with the things around us. Everything is chemical. I want to, this is going to be very chauvinistic because we chemists are always saying yes. this, but, but one of the things you hear in the chemistry circles is that chemistry is called the central science. And, and for very good reason, I think, for exactly what Roald is saying, chemistry is in everything. You look around here and everything has undergone some kind of molecular synthesis at some point and fashioned into some material eventually. But it's all molecules and, and, and I think we are now at a position, both biology as well, that frontier, materials, uh, we finally understand these things at the molecular level, mm -hmm. thanks to work like Roll does, theoretical mm -hmm. and so on. So, so why chem chemistry? Chemistry is at the center of, of everyday life, uh, and, and everything is composed of molecules. And, and that's what we are trained to do, understand and build these molecules. So it's the most important science, I hate to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're in good company <laughs> in believing that. Um, and luckily, science in general is getting a lot more attention and a lot its importance is being appreciated increasingly. Uh, President Barack Obama, in several speeches now, including one he gave last night, in which our Public Service Awards mm -hmm. awardee was being recognized, as well as our L T. Waterman awardee and Vannevar Bush awardee, um, and just the important contributions that you all make to science. There are increasing resources to science now in the federal budget. I'm incredibly encouraged. Is it a bright new day? Yes, it is a bright new day. I'm still waiting for my NSF grant to be <laughs> renewed, but it is a bright day overall. What a difference in sort of general attitude for what science can do. Uh, it's wonderful. It's almost ironic because, of course, we are in a uh, very serious economic problem. And yes. at the same time, science is getting all this attention, which I am 100% in, in, in agreement with. Uh, even I think two days ago, I think it was uh, Steve Chu uh, was saying the things that uh, Energy DOE in particular uh, are going to be doing. And uh, he understands the value of what he called applied research as well as fundamental research. So funding from this administration is going for both of that, recognizing it was interesting. He, he's setting up uh, using the old Bell Laboratories as a model. And I think it's what I'm going to set yes. eight of these or so. Uh, the idea of being driven by by some kind of uh, practical application at the end. But what he said was that's the way Bell Labs operated. And along the way to whatever it was that they were looking for, a lot of other very, very interesting and important stuff happened. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the fundamental and applied both have a very strong support from this administration, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, I think that's great. I, I do want to be a little reflective about uh, people's attitudes ab about science, Please. no matter how much uh, 
this administration will do. I mean, science and technology both have have done wonderful things. It's a, in the twentieth century, if one were to point to anything, the knowledge gained about the world inside and around us is one of the greatest uh, things we have we have learned, and it has increased the lifespan of people in most countries, not everywhere. From forty to eighty, you just have to walk in a nineteenth century graveyard to see to see small children's graves and such, and women dying in childbirth. It's created an a increased standard of living, better safe water, birth control, colors in our dress would be available only to rich people. And the whole world has been created. And yet people remain, at some level, unhappy with science and technology. and or perhaps suspicious of it overall. Now, why is that so? One thing you could say is that people are unhappy in general. They're never going to be happy, no matter what you give them. But I think there's more. I think if you try to pinpoint the concerns, they're ecological, environmental, and moral in mm -hmm. some sense. Uh, moral concerns have to do, in some way, if you probe it, with some transgression of the natural order, whatever that <laughs> is. And chemistry is hell-bent on, on doing that, in part, making synthetic molecules, trying to improve on nature. Improving nature has several senses. It's changing nature. The ecological environmental concerns are clear. Um, and we have perturbed the major cycles of this world. Uh, Half the nitrogen atoms in your body and our bodies have seen the inside of a chemical factory. There are two ways to look at this. One way is to look, yes, that's incredible. Our technology has influenced that. I'm talking about the Haber-Bosch process, an incredible process, exactly 100 years old for turning the nitrogen of the atmosphere into ammonia and fertilizers. And then the other way of looking at it is half the people in this world would not be alive if it were not for that industry of the chemical fertilizers. Mm. I think that's actually the right way to look at it. But people worry about these things. So what's the answer? Or how should we respond? I think part of the response in this millennium is that we, we do have to attach to our incredible creativity and capacity for invention, ethical, moral, environmental ecological concerns, doing impact assessments, if we want to call it that. And it has to be done by the scientists themselves to say, I am cloning and let somebody else worry about this, is not a third millennium response. I think the scientist has to find out about what the consequences of the cloning is and worry about it too. and even about misuse by others. I think scientists have to work in ethics mm -hmm. into the considerations of what they do. I cannot add much more to that, sure. We agree 100%. Uh, in matters of environment uh, uh, at the NSF, uh, the chemistry division right now is in the process of a realignment, we call it, sort of like a little bit of a structured difference. And one of the things that chemistry is moving away from is the traditional classification of chemistry into organic, inorganic, analytical, physical. We are coming out with a structure that hopefully uh, adjusts better to these realities that you're mentioning. One of these programs is going to be environmental chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, we recognize this as being something fundamentally important to do that presently is not being funded very well. Um, it's scattered. Uh, it is scattered all scattered. over. Scattered. Well, the integrative nature of all of the sciences mm -hmm. is the direction yes. in which we're going. And green chemistry, for instance, is something that captures the imagination of young people mm -hmm. who want to do something for the world. Mm -hmm. So the more we can structure work in that supportive work in that direction, yeah. it's important. Yeah, I don't know if, if what, what Roald is saying, I, don't, I always forget statistics, I'm not very good at this, but to make a chip, I forget the, uh, the kilograms of uh, solvent per chip or whatever right. that, that are generated in the process. 
simply because people haven't worried about can we do this more efficiently, which right. is the green chemistry or atom efficiency? Can we do something and not waste most of it, uh, which is what we presently do a lot of that. We make the compounds we want, and we don't worry how we get uh, there are more efficient ways to get there. But we need to pay much closer attention to, to yes. being responsible uh, in chemical synthesis in particular. Yes, and being responsible as citizens of the world, Roald has certainly taken a leadership role in using scientific diplomacy, I guess the catchphrase would be. Um, today is the birthday of the State of Israel. You've spent time in the Middle East. Tell us about your efforts in that front. Well, it was something also that was done with uh, the help of an unusual program in the chemistry division, specifically at NSF, called the Discovery Corps. Um, the, uh, we all want to do something in the Middle East, uh, but how to do it in the face of so many forces? Um, I have ties to Israel, I have relatives there, but I, it happens I'm also interested in Arabic culture for various reasons. And so I, I move fairly easily in a cultural world between the two. I. Uh, had an idea. We've had three years conferences which were initially supported by NSF called the Malta Conferences, which were uh, organized by Zafra Lerman, a very energetic person at Columbia College, which brought together chemists from Israel, Arab countries, and the Iran, incidentally. We've had three meetings. The third one is coming up in Jordan. Uh, the first two were outside in Malta and in Istanbul. Um, we, um, I got an idea to move these conferences to which mostly senior chemistry professors came to a younger level. And I had two ideas, to move them to younger participants and to have them in the Middle East, mm -hmm. which meant realistically to have them in either Jordan or Egypt or possibly the United Arab Emirates. We wound up having three such conferences, uh, workshops. I taught one. Gr great scientists taught the others. Uh, uh, there was uh, George Whitesides and Steve Lippard. These were small, 15 people, and they were not too expensive to fund. I funded them with the help of a fellowship to me to do this from the National Science Foundation chemistry division in an experimental program that they had. I had a simple idea. Uh, part of it was you get a group of people together with a common language, and you work the hell out of them. <laughs> this is the Marine Corps principle. Um, and the common language was science. And the working, uh, working them meant that we were in Petra, a beautiful tourist site, but for six and a half of the seven days, uh, we taught nine hours a day, wow. these people. And that is a great drain on the instructors. But they bond then. Mm. That's why I'm, what I mean by the Marine Corps principle in part. It's not that they view their professor as an enemy. They're in there to share something and to learn. But from the shared experience, they bonded. Small scale, ideally, I would hope that we'd get in this, the future leaders of chemistry from all these various countries. We run into political problems, and not only between Israel and the Arab countries. Um, suspicion of Iran in the Arab countries is very high. Mm. There we, hadn't, we could not get Iranian students into Egypt. Anyway, this is something I've done. I'm working on something else, perhaps a materials research institute in Qatar right now. I would like to do that. Before that, my, re my reasons for interest are deeper. In the middle of graduate school, after two years of graduate school, I went to the Soviet Union in 1960. That was seven years after Stalin died. Mm -hmm. I came from what is now the Ukraine. Uh, my mother thought I'd be drafted into the Soviet Army. Harvard didn't like it. I went for a year to study exciton theory with Davidoff. It was very interesting. Uh, culturally important. I've traveled to Cuba in the 80s and 90s. Um, I do believe in science serving as a bridge, a language, a common language, 
where we can talk um, across cultures it helps. Mm. Now, Luis, you've had international experience as well. Yeah, quite a bit. Uh, uh, I, I couldn't express it any better than role. Uh, but since you mentioned specifically travel to Cuba, I will mention that. It, for those people who may have been watching this from the beginning, uh, Lisa Joy said that I was born in Cuba. Uh, yes. And it's a sad story in many ways because I left uh, in 1960 when I was nine years old. And I was not able to visit again until 39 years later, mm. at which time I met a cousin of mine who was 39 at, that, at the time. Uh, and ironically, even the irony is even worse. I, I used to live in Miami, which is 90 miles <laughs> away right. from Havana. Yeah. Uh, so for 39 years, I, I was unable to go. So, so I, I believe strongly. I, I have visited Cuba four times um, since uh, 1999. And uh, I think it, it, what you sense immediately in the chemistry community, the scientific community in general, is people don't really care that much about the politics and uh, they, they're really above the politics that the language of science unites everyone mm -hmm. and the, the the reception I got there was absolutely fantastic very warm and and very eager to learn what they could learn and to connect with me uh, so yes. I sincerely hope things change soon and it seems like the it looks like they are changing yes. uh, in our relations you have to also see how international our enterprise is. I'm sure it's true for Lois too. But in my group, I've had over 43 years of activity. I've had, okay, 30 graduate students, but I've had 125 postdocs, mm. many of them supported with NSF funding. And they are from all over. There are 20 Germans in that group, 10 from France, five from Japan, and it just goes on to the mm. smaller countries. Science is a very international enterprise. Um, postdoctoral fellowships especially uh, are viewed as introductions. Uh, they are test also that these Germans wanted to come uh, to us is testimony of America's preeminence in science. And maybe that not so many want to come now may tell us something. There, there are, there, these are, but these are ways of forming relationships, incredible friendships. The family structure of a research group propagates. Mm -hmm. These are friends for life. Yeah. Actually, I, I, I'll say two things. One, from the NSF perspective, chemistry division in particular, uh, international programs are receiving a lot of attention at the NSF. The chemistry division has had a program in place since 2006 called ICC, International Collaborations in Chemistry. And uh, right now we have five countries that we are uh, doing uh, exchanges and co-funding co with. And we now have about five or six more that are going to be added on next year, including Japan. We, we, we have UK, Germany, uh, Austria, China, and uh, I forget which one, is in France right now. And we're going to put Japan, Poland, uh, Russia, and uh, probably Brazil. And, uh, and others uh, as, we, as we move along. And it's working really well, and the response from the chemistry community in the U.S. is incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you, everywhere you go, uh, Spain and so on, ev everyone is very interested in doing this. Scientists are very interested in making the world truly flat. And, uh, and I mm -hmm. think we're on our way. Uh, our model in the uh, chemistry division is actually catching on very nicely. I, I think mm -hmm. uh, the Office of International Science and Engineering likes the model uh, very much, so so we're expanding that. And on a personal note, I, I think almost one out of every two articles I publish has a foreign collaborator on. Mm. That gives you an idea for how much I like. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's not only the science, but also the social aspects of it are very interesting. Yes. Good for you. It seems our language of science is certainly spanning the geographic borders throughout the world. I'm thinking of other borders, um, some perhaps more formidable, and that is the borders of popular culture. I think in popular culture, um, they're understanding the language of science. Um, in movies and films, books, uh, plays, they're incorporating main protagonists, TV shows. Tell mm -hmm. me, what do you think of this? Do you think it's a revolution? In the loose sense of the word, of course. <laughs> the United States has been actually very good in um, 
po receiving popular science, po popularizations of science. I can't say that we chemists uh, have done so well in this. No, if you go, you're shaking your head. <laughs> if you go in a bookstore and you look at the popular science uh, shelves, um, you, you don't see very much. Uh, I have tried to contribute a little, but I, I can't do it. Um, there are, we need more popularizers of science. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip Ball is a great British writer who has written a number of books about science, that I th about chemistry specific, and materials that I think are, he's, he's th the best uh, that we have sort of in this field. Yes, it is entering theater, and I write plays too. Uh, there are more science-oriented plays from Copenhagen. Carl Gerasi, a colleague of ours, an organic chemist, a great organic chemist, has devoted uh, the last 20 years of his life to writing novels and plays and has had some impact. Um, we try to reach out. I wish we could get more chemists to do this. So I would ask the NSF to take its outreach and broader impact criterion more seriously. Uh, to um, There's a carrot and a stick needed. Uh, I'll, actually, I'll respond to it because <laughs> uh, our chemistry division uh, underwent a very in-depth uh, review of uh, pretty much strategic planning, strategic directions for the future. Uh, as a result of a committee of visitors that, that came in 2000, was it 2007, I think, and told us, why didn't you look forward and what are you going to do? And, and the analysis yielded, it was a SWOT analysis, eight critical issues. And one of the critical issues is disseminating chemistry to the general public. Because for the, for the most part, what we do really reasonably well, I think, is NOVA and uh, but, but those shows are not reaching the public in general. Those shows are really mm -hmm. almost uh, preaching to the convert, converted, right? Uh, we need to reach everyone. And I think OPA is doing a pretty good job at trying very hard to get these things into YouTube and get science to where the kids are. Uh, but so, so anyway, it's one of our strategic issues in the chemistry division, and we are uh, presently actually looking at proposals in our portfolio to do precisely that, trying to reach the public, uh, teach and disseminate yeah. chemistry to the public. But it's not easy. YouTube is very interesting. Of course, uh, for us of a certain generation, it feels different, mm -hmm. and if not strange. Uh, but one interesting little story, there's something that's caught on via YouTube in England, and this is my friend Martin Polyakov. Uh, Martin Polyakov, uh, looks like Einstein. He has a Jewish <laughs> afro and goes <laughs> off in every direction. He looks like a mad professor, but he's very nerdy in part of his appearance. It's this combination of the mad professor and the nerd <laughs> that, that's uh, made for TV image. <laughs> and with an offbeat British director, Martin, with almost no support whatsoever from the British sources, if it's not our people, has made a series of 50, 60 videos about the periodic table. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, with the help of two staff members and some students, and these things are on purpose clunky, emulating a certain kind of amateurishness which mm -hmm. sells in YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have been visited a million times, yeah. these periodic table videos. It's rather amusing to see the Royal Society of Chemistry and uh, to to wake up to to this which someone has pioneered. Um, wonderful. I wish we could have some. I wish we could have. I w we got to encourage Dan Nasera to do something. So this <laughs> one of those things. And you know, one of the ideas that we came uh, up with, and we're going to do, I think it's this summer for the first time. Uh, you can even do it cheaper than, than this. And, and we think it might have the right impact. Because you were saying, to our generation, YouTube is still something that I don't associate oh, with. But, My generation. But, uh, but the younger ones. So mm -hmm. what we're going to do is for the REU program, the Research Experience for Undergraduate program, yes. where we have 650 students involved every summer. We are going to throw a competition, uh, put a YouTube uh, piece on the research that you did. 
That's and great. if you win, right. we'll send you to the American Chemical Society, right. all expenses paid. Uh, you know, it, it, it'll be ridiculously uh, low uh, cost That's for right. us. And I bet you some of those YouTubes are going to be probably better than I could definitely probably. make. Uh, there have been some excellent ones. There's a terrific one on the Large Hadron Collider, the RAP. I saw that one. <laughs> it's yeah, hilarious, it but yet it's really informative. Yeah, there are some. Yes. There's one or other amusing competition, Dance Your PhD. There you go. Seeing where they, there's a competition among groups for people to design some sort of very amateurish dance, but some choreographed or professionally. But I'm sure a, younger, a young person can do something that yeah. will appeal to younger people better sure. than what I would do, uh, for sure. So, yep. so it's an experiment. We'll, we'll try it, and uh, we're hoping that it will become useful to disseminate uh, uh, what we do through the RU program to, to other young people. Yeah. I think using a variety of methods to communicate the importance of science is, is critical. Roald, you've done it so effectively. I've tried. We made uh, 20 years ago over a, a series of films about chemistry called The World of Chemistry. They were made out of University of Maryland nearby, and there was some NSF support for them. Main support came from Annenberg, uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You know, to this day, I still get an email a week from a student, and there is a YouTube uh, or a MySpace group of kids who are watching that. And I'm 20 years older, and I in that movie, a, a series, I have hair and. Uh, <laughs> and well, do, you, do you know one of our, our colleagues, a young woman, a science assistant here at NSF? Yeah. She remembers you from then. I know. The she screamed when your name was announced <laughs> as the recipient. I yes, and uh, we, and Don Showalter did explosions, and I was the more philosophical person. <laughs> Neither of us was sent to acting school. <laughs> <laughs> Yet there's always time. Uh, we. We had a good time. I think some mistakes were made. We didn't prepare a textbook. Um, I would have been better in front of a live audience than in a, just in front of a camera, but uh, that's because I rise to the occasion. <laughs> students. But we, it was, there's nothing better out there, which is too bad. We need a, we need a new television series about chemistry. Yep. Yeah. And we're, I think uh, if someone would come up with a proposal NSF, I bet, would be interested. We would be interested, for sure. We would certainly uh, be interested. CSI yeah. is sort of the closest thing that... Uh, yeah, kids uh, know that. They, 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 I mean, it's become sort of like a phenomenon. Now you have three CSIs. Uh, we, we had a symposium at an, an ACS meeting, a National uh, American Chemical Society meeting, on forensics. And it was standing room only. We had yeah. requested a room of 250, and it was packed mainly by students yeah. interested in getting into CSI. Uh, and it's it's a little bit of a problem because they, they all think that the glamour of the show is going to be what they're going to get into. So, so the tone of this symposium was you have to become a good analytical chemist mm -hmm. first. Uh, there are not that many people running around the streets of Miami searching for <laughs> clues, and uh, it's only a few of them. So, so you get you, your chances of really making it into a CSI-like position are right. not that high. Uh, Yes. But, but it's, it has changed perceptions. I mean, people perceive all of these mass spectrometers and uh, you know the instruments that they show. It's like wow. Unfortunately, some of it is not true. They, they true. make it sound like you take this boom and you know everything, well, that is, uh, which is not true. Everything but, uh, comes out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But but it, it's a good uh, publicity. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, Our social science from the NSF has pointed to the fact that even if not precisely accurate, just having science in these means of popular culture and these yes. modes increases our interest and but has curiosity. It, it has generated a lot of new programs in forensics, sure. uh, which in, in a way needs to be controlled. Uh, you announce a program in forensic chemistry or forensic sciences and immediately you have 300 students lined up right. to go into the program. Uh, and it needs to be there aren't really necessarily cautious. the jobs at the that's, end. That's the point. <laughs> no, <there's> Definitely <laughs> not on the streets <laughs> of New York and uh, Las Vegas and uh, uh, Miami. Right. Yeah. Roald, you've done a lot of creative things, taking a lot of risks. What are you most proud of? Is uh, it your poetry? Um, no, I'm most proud of being a teacher. <laughs> I think so. It's those I mentioned those uh, teaching introductory chemistry. Thousands of students. Uh, Listening with varying degrees of attention, but as the light goes on in the eyes of a few, and 
And if you feel that you've enabled the powers that lie dormant within them, what are you teaching and that the facts are unimportant? Okay. It's the ways of thinking. Then that makes me feel good. I think overall the teaching. And then I view the teaching very broadly. I view that my teaching has made me a better researcher. Mm. By learning, it's true that I am in my research in the business of explaining things, theoretically, as we talked about. I, I can't draw the line. I learn how to explain to fresh. It's a different audience, the freshman students there. And it's true, I know that stuff. But each time in the 40 years, I found something that I didn't. <laughs> didn't know, that, I, that somehow I found a better way of explaining yes. it. And that qu ability, learning how to explain this, and learning the signals from the nonverbal ones, I can apply in my research. It's not a, without a struggle. The rhetoric of pedagogy, so to speak, which may involve repetition or something, isn't going to get you a lot of favorable reception from editors and referees, necessarily. But I write my papers, always have written. And that's the secret to my success. I write my papers for an intelligent graduate student. The hell with a professor. <laughs> His mind is not going to be changed. But the young graduate student, they have open minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can influence them. Why do I want to influence them? I want to show them my way of thinking. I think it's useful. So I'm most proud of being a teacher. This hour has flown by. It has been fascinating speaking with both of you. Perhaps in closing, we'll give you a moment in the sun and you can explain why chemistry is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think chemistry is a universe of molecules. So there's a microscopic way. There are these atoms. They're doing things. And I said, sometimes they're doing things that can hurt you, sometimes things that very much can heal you. It's, and then there's substances. And I think it's so incredible that we have learned to move back and forth between the microscopic and the macroscopic, that we can talk in one breath of molecules and we make substances and the properties of those substances are influenced by our thinking about molecules. I think this motion between micro and macro is on the scale of things that can influence our bodies is what's great about chemistry. Thank you so much to both of you. Louise, Roald, for me, this has been better living through chemistry, or at least <laughs> through spending time with yeah, chemists. Thank you. I appreciate Lisa, it very Thank you much. very much. Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for watching. This is Lisa Joy Zagorski with the National Science Foundation. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.